Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. The title of our study is Overcoming Storms. As we enter chapter 14 here, uh, we've now covered the birth of Christ, his baptism, his early ministry, miracles. We've looked at parables. We took a few weeks doing that. And today we're going to see, well, there's some sad news and some difficult uh, trouble ahead. We're going to see the death of John the Baptist. We'll see some, uh, some miracles that take place, the feeding over 5,000 people. And we'll see uh, Jesus walking on water, uh, the stormy water. And uh, so as I was thinking about that, how do we handle the storms of this life? When we get in the sudden news of a loved one or a friend that has passed away. I was sad to hear about the news of Mandisa uh, recently. And, and, and there's things that, like that that happens suddenly, right? How do, we, how do we deal with those things in our life? How do we deal with it someone close to us? Um, or we get the news about a health condition and it doesn't look promising. Or some calamity that comes upon us. How do we work through those things? How do we wrestle through them? And, and today we're going to see how to overcome the storms of this life from Jesus himself. And so with that, we'll take a look at the first 12 verses. And uh, we'll see the, the death of John the Baptist. And I think we'll also see uh, with Herod the death of a conscience. And so with that, we'll pick up here in Matthew chapter 14, looking at the first 12 verses. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitudes because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with them, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John the Baptist, had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And the disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. We'll pause there. We see that all this is occurring at the time where the fame of Jesus is spreading. Uh, the miracles are spreading like wildfire. All over the Roman Empire, people are starting to hear about uh, this Jewish man named Jesus. And, and Herod, at that time, was in power. Um, Herod's actually a title. It's a family name, a family dynasty. Uh, they were descendants of Esau. And so uh, this is not the same Herod that was in power at the birth of Jesus. Uh, this is his son. And so uh, he's a ruler of Galilee. His name is Herod Antipas. Uh, his father uh, self-named himself Herod the Great. He really wasn't that great. Uh, he was kind of a monster. I mean, he was not a guy you wanted to cross. In fact, they said that day it was safer to be one of his sons, or excuse me, they said it was safer to be one of his pigs than it was to be one of his sons or his wives. Uh, he was a paranoid kind of guy. And if he didn't like something you were up to, you were gone. And so safer to be one of the animals uh, that he had than a relative. But eventually he did pass. And uh, like father, like son, his sons begin to rule in his stead. He had four sons that each took about a quarter of the, the land. And uh, so he was a tetrarch or a governor over one-fourth of the area uh, as the land was divided and each son ruled over their territory. But like father, like son, they, were, uh, they weren't very kind rulers either. They ruled by fear and, um, and violence. And so John the Baptist came and he rebuked uh, King Herod about the way that he was living. And, uh, and he specifically rebuked him for divorcing his wife and marrying his brother, uh, Philip, marrying uh, his wife, Herodias. 
and, and call them out on that. And, and this is all happening while Philip was still living. It's not like the brother died and decided, oh, I'll help family out. No, this is, this is like soap opera kind of stuff, right? It's really weird. But uh, when you're in power, I think you, you're probably thinking, I can do whatever I want. I'm the guy in charge. And so that was taking place. And, um, and so this was in violation of God's law. It was in violation of God's plan for marriage from the beginning, right? In the book of Genesis, God said that marriage is between one man and one woman, right? And, and the goal is for life, right? Till death do us part. And so John the Baptist told here, you know, this is not good. You're not pleasing God uh, by your actions. But we kind of see here that Herodias held a grudge with anger towards John because he dared to speak out. And he dared to speak out about this. And, um, but we see that Herod... Uh, could have executed John at that time. Uh, but I think in order to kind of appease his wife, he had John put in prison, right? At least he did something is kind of what he was thinking. And so we see, uh, again, he was a powerful ruler. He could have had already had John the Baptist killed, but he, he realized that people thought of John as a prophet. And, and he did have some intriguing conversations with him because he spoke the truth. And so Herod decided not to put him to death. Um, and so it, it's, I think it's also a good reminder for us to know that there is a time and a place for calling out sin. We see it occurring in the lives of others, um, right? If there's a relative who's dabbling in drugs, this is the most loving thing to do, to do is to confront and, and to try and offer help, right? Because you care about them. You love them, right? You, you don't want to see them head down a path of destruction, and so sometimes the, the loving thing to do is to speak the truth in love, right? To be gracious towards them. You want to see them rescued. Um, and, and that should be the goal, right? We want to speak the truth in love with a spirit of humility and forgiveness. And I think that was John's approach, right? He, he wanted to see Herod repent. He wanted to see Herod say, you know what, John, you're right. It was not lawful. Uh, I, I, need, I need forgiveness. But unfortunately, we don't see that happen. Um, but for me, it reminds me... Uh, as 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, it says, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. And that should be our attitude as well, right? We're not nitpicky and pointing out everyone's sin, right? We've got our own to deal with, right? The Lord to forgive us of. But we come alongside every now and then, and we, we want to help people, right? We want to see them grow in Christ. And that goal is repentance and restoration. And so we see the, uh, that Herodias, seizing the opportunity of knowing Herod's birthday was coming up, um, she came and, and, uh, and she wanted the head of John the Baptist. And uh, apparently the performance of this, this uh, daughter um, uh, came and, and performed greatly and and this girl danced before the king, and, and the king makes this oath and says, ask me whatever you like, and I will give it to you. The other gospel accounts tell us, he said, up to half my kingdom, which, I mean, why would you make a statement like that? <laughs> um, and so he's thinking, I'll give you whatever you want, riches, land, I mean, up to half my kingdom. You can have it. Um, I'll give it to you. And in essence, with these words, Herod flaunted his power, right, and his, his greatness before his guests. But soon he would come to deeply regret those words. And so Herodias' daughter went and asked her mother, well, what should I ask for? And she replied, the head of John the Baptist. And without skipping a beat, she went back and told the king, this is what I want. Uh, I want the head of John the Baptist. And we see eventually this daughter, her cruelty matched that of her mother. Uh, I mean, to take a life of somebody else simply because your, your parents don't like them. I mean, that's kind of cruel in a sense. And, and so we see, again, um, this is a very interesting family, <laughs> one that I would want to be next to. Um, but we see Herod feared the people. He felt like he was unable to take back that oath that he had made. Um, and so the king granted the girl's wish and dispatched an executioner uh, to the prison where John the Baptist Baptist was being held, um, 
As I was thinking about this, you know, the death of John the Baptist, I think there's also another death that takes place here, and it's the death of a conscience. We see that it says that Herod was sorry, but it was a worldly sorrow. It wasn't a godly sorrow that leads towards repentance. And so he had seared his conscience. And the word conscience comes from two words, con meaning with, right? Like if you go somewhere and you want a burrito con chips, right? You want, a, you want your chips with your burrito, right? Uh, and then science meaning knowledge, right? So conscience, it's, it's with knowledge. And so God's given each of us a conscience. We each have knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. And Herod knew what was right and he knew what was wrong. And he, he began to ignore that conscience. He began to not listen to that conscience. And we see that he worried more about the reputation of doing what is right in, in the eyes of himself and, 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 and to appease others than to do what's right in the sight of God and appease God. As I think about that, I hope we're mindful uh, that God sees everything that takes place, right? God sees it all, and, and, and our goal should be wanting to please the Lord most high. And while it takes courage, like John the Baptist, to stand up and confront sin, you need to know the outcome may not always work in your favor, may not always go as expected, um, and so just realize that there are times where you may lovingly come to someone and say, hey, I see this direction in your life, and it, it's not good. They may not respond in a way that, that you're hoping. They may say, who are you to tell me this? Get out of my life, right? It, it, it happens. I don't think John the Baptist was expecting uh, to end up where he ended up. Um, so we need to, need to realize that, that sometimes there is a cost, but the hope is restoration, reconciliation. And that shouldn't shrink us back from sharing the truth. Again, we want to do that in love. And so while it may seem that John the Baptist lost his head here, the truth is Herod's the one who lost his head. Right? He lost his conscience and he lost uh, really his integrity in doing what is right. And sadly, there are many like him that uh, unfortunately can be bribed or uh, they get a power trip that they're, they're in charge, right? And so we see that he lost his head. And so, you know, don't lose your head over a girl, I guess you could say. Um, but we see he was troubled by his guilty conscience in a sense. And that's why this, this is here is because he thought that as Jesus performing these mighty miracles, that this is John the Baptist risen from the dead. He's thinking, uh, who is this guy, right? And, and yet, rather than then heed that and realize, you know, the last thing John told me was repent and rebuke me. Maybe I need to do that. We see Herod um, continue to sear his own conscience, continue to, uh, to not listen. And, and so we see that he was, he was paranoid, and he became very paranoid when he heard about Jesus and, and, and the miracles that Christ was performing and yet he, he failed to repent, and he ended up far from God, and a very tragic life of him and, and uh, the Herod family, that whole dynasty, uh, ended up away from the Lord. So after this, we see that the disciples came and took away the body and buried it, and they went and they told Jesus. And we'll see next uh, at Jesus' interaction through that, and then also seeing multitudes and multitudes of people coming to be healed and and coming uh, to hear him, that end up hungry, and we'll see what happens here as we move to the next section. So we'll pick up here in verse 13, we'll go through verse 21, and we'll look at the feeding of the 5,000, really over 5,000. And so picking up here in uh, verse 13, when Jesus heard of it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot and from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to be sent away. You give them something to eat." 
And they said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to his disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Pause there. Wow. First we see Jesus was moved with compassion for the multitudes. That word compassion is a compact word. It means love in action. Right? Both the disciples and Jesus saw the multitudes and saw the need of the people. But Jesus was moved with compassion for them. And being aware of their needs, he used the power that God gave him to go about feeding the multitudes, and thus proving that he is God himself, the Son of God. And so Jesus told his disciples, you give them something to eat. And, and as he's doing that, he, he's, in essence, testing the disciples' faith here as well, uh, challenging them on how, how are they going to work through this situation, and, uh, and yet, if they had seen and remembered the track record of Jesus, they would realize there's nothing too hard for the Lord, right? There's nothing, nothing too hard. He's healed many, many people at this point. He can do this. Um, but we see that uh, they're still kind of wrestling through that. And, and yet, it reminds me that he will not ask them to do something without guiding them through it. And so I think it's fascinating that at the end of this, there are 12 baskets full, one for each of them to carry <laughs> and look and realize, yeah, he knew what he was talking about, right? And so God had something for each of his disciples to learn through this miracle. And what's also fascinating that aside from the resurrection of Jesus, this is the, the only account that is in all four Gospels. It's, it's something that was so uh, important that they felt that, that they wanted each of their audiences to know about. In fact, one of the earliest symbols of Christianity actually was not the cross. It was actually the symbol of the fish. And for many of them, as they uh, began to be persecuted, um, they actually would use that symbol uh, in their interactions. They would do a part of the fish on the floor, and the other person would complete that part of the fish, and they knew then it was safe to interact with that person. If the other person didn't know what was going on, then you kind of had some time to <laughs> start running the other direction and realize that, you know, this is not, not another believer in Christ. And so the symbol of the fish and uh, the loaves as well was a very powerful symbol to the early church. And so we see the, um, in John's account, in John chapter 6, verse 9, it gives us a little more detail that uh, this was a boy's lunch that was brought, five barley loaves and two small fish. And, and yet for Jesus, that was enough, right? That was enough for Jesus to take and multiply to the masses. And we see Jesus looking up to heaven. He blessed the Father for the food that he did have that was given. And, and he probably prayed a very familiar Jewish prayer, as the Jewish people often pray before they partake of a meal, which is, Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth living bread from heaven. And yet here's the living bread in front of them, providing more bread, right, and more food for the people. And amazingly, this entire multitude ate and were filled, right, from a small meal that uh, was initially provided. And so we see they all ate and were satisfied. And, and Jesus didn't just meet the need. He, he lavished it upon them, right? They, they ate and they could have as much as they wanted. In fact, then there were 12 baskets full of fragments left afterwards. And as I was thinking about that, um, you know, this, this miracle of Jesus displays his total power over creation, his authority over nature itself. And it shows us that God has resources we know nothing about, right? The disciples didn't know how he was going to do it. But he could do it. And, uh, and I think sometimes we tend to only have faith when we can figure out how God might work things out. Sometimes we have faith only when we know how God's going to provide. And we need to realize 
Lord, your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. You can do things that I would never even have imagined. And so we see here to feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. It seems impossible, but not for Jesus. And, and, and it indeed is miraculous, right? Matthew further emphasizes by, by saying, besides women and children. Many Bible scholars believe that the crowds were enormous. There could have been anywhere between fifteen to 20,000 in total. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of mouths to feed. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a lot of people. And I don't know how long it took to feed everyone, um, but there were a lot of people there. And they all ate and they were all satisfied. And I, and I bring this up as a point because there are some who suggest that there was another way that Jesus orchestrated this. Some say that, well, there was a hidden cave somewhere with supplies, and he, he had the disciples go and get the, the supplies and then distribute it to everyone. 15, 20,000, that's a lot. Some have suggested, well, they, they had some extra food up their sleeves and, and it was hidden, and so when they saw people being generous, they got the food out of their sleeves and began to share it as well. For 15, 20,000 people, I don't think so. <laughs> Matthew's making it very clear this was miraculous. There was no human way possible to feed that many people. And in fact, from, from five loaves and, and two small fish, it was, it was a miracle of God. And so each of the disciples were just in awe of what Jesus had done. And it reminds me that God will shatter the small size expectations we have of what he can do if we would only learn to bring to him what we've already been given. God can do much with very little. In fact, little is much when God is in it. Right? There's nothing too hard for him. And so this was a miracle of God, Jesus demonstrating his power. And it reminds me when we're willing to offer our lives sacrificially, letting go of what we have and, 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 and hold on to God, we're going to see him do great things. When we let go of those things, whether in terms of time, money, or, or talents, God will use these ordinary things to do extraordinary things. Right? God can take the things that we have and, and use them in, in awesome ways for his glory. I remember years ago when my wife Anna and I, we sensed God calling us to come out to Minnesota, to Fergus Falls, to, to plant a Calvary Chapel church. We never would have imagined that we'd be where we're at today. It wasn't even on our radar, right? And yet I, I can realize that when we left there in 2013, um, God, God already knew. Right? He, had, he had other plans, right? And we just needed to take a step at a time to follow him. And, and I realized that um, I'm still learning. I shouldn't say ever. Right. I'm still learning to never put limits on what God can do. Um, I think he continues to astonish us and how he can rescue people and, and redeem people and the things that only he can do. And, um, and so I, I believe that God is more concerned with our heart than he is with um, our resources. Right? If we realize that all that we have is his already, we're just called to be managers or stewards of it, then God can do a great, a great blessing through that. And so I think that's where God's concern is. He wants, he wants our heart. If he can get a hold of that, then everything else is his, right, as it should be. And so we, we never want to believe our resources are too little or that we're too little to serve God, right? God can use us for his glory. God can use the things we have for his glory. And I believe that God delights in taking a humble seemingly insignificant person using him or her for his glory. And so we should be thankful to God for what we have, what he's provided for us. Um, we want to trust in God's unlimited resources, the things that he has that we have no clue about, right? God can come through and take care of things. And the more you trust him, the more you see his faithfulness, you see his track record. God, you've never failed me. You're not going to fail me. I don't need to worry about this. I can trust you. I can trust in your provision. I can trust in your leading. And, and yet at the same time, we don't want to waste what he gives us. Right? We're called to be good stewards of what he's entrusted to us. 
And we need to also remember that where God guides, he provides, right? If we're trusting the Lord, he'll lead us the right way. It may not happen in the time that we want it to happen. Oftentimes we want things right now. God's patient. Trust him. Things will happen in his timing. We just need to keep our eyes upon him. And in fact, that's what we'll see next, that Jesus makes this great illustration of uh, reminding his disciples the need to focus on him, the, the need to have a dependence and a reliance upon him. And we'll see that next in verse 22 when we'll go to the end of the chapter uh, and look at Jesus walking on water, and uh, we'll see somebody else gets out of the boat and walks as well. And so picking up here in verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Well, he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, uh, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him, Walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Verse 34. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent into all the surrounding region and brought to him all who were sick and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. As many as touched it were made perfectly well. Wow, we see what a busy day of ministry. And in the midst of all this busyness that's taking place, of the great ministry of Jesus serving others, we see Jesus did not neglect the importance of praying, the importance of getting alone with the Father and praying. We know that Jesus wept over the death of Lazarus. It's one of the shortest verses in all the scripture. Jesus wept, right, from John 11. And I believe Jesus probably wept over John the Baptist as well. Um, and the reality is this, is, this is the calm before the storm. And Jesus goes in a solitude, solitary place to, to reconnect with the Father, right? to spend time in prayer. And it's a good reminder to us that we need to take breaks. We need to have time alone with God as well. Spending time with Him in prayer and the Word to be refreshed, to be refocused. And to be refueled, we need that, right? We're not, we're not machines. We can't operate 24-7. We need breaks. We need time alone with God to hear from him, to be encouraged and equipped. And so I think this is an important lesson to help us weather the storms of this life. Jesus sends the disciples away so that he can be alone on the mountain to pray, to have that alone time with the Heavenly Father. And if Jesus needs this, right? Even with the needs of so many people pricing him, if the Lord makes solitary time to pray, how much more do we need that, right? How much more do we need that time alone with our Father and to hear from him, time to pray, time for direction? Right? If anyone had a busy life of ministry, it would have been Jesus, right? And we never want to get to that place where you say, you know, Lord, I'd love to spend time with you today, but looking at my schedule, I'm too busy, Jesus had a very busy life, but he made that time. He saw the importance of it, right? And I think we need to have that same mindset, that it should be our priority as well. 
Well, we see that the disciples are now out into the middle of the sea. It's actually not a, not a sea that we would think of. It's a lake. Um, when you get to the land of Israel, you'll, you'll see that they kind of overemphasize things sometimes. Uh, there's mountains. We would say they're more like hills. Um, there's seas. Well, they're, they're more like lakes. Um, but you, you get there and you, and you realize in that area where uh, the wind blows with the desert and it mixes with the Mediterranean, um, they could get violent storms there on, on this lake on the Sea of Galilee. And so it was something that was very common. And, uh, and we know that a few of the disciples were fishermen. Uh, many of them were. But we see as they're in this boat and in the middle of the lake, Jesus wasn't with them. And we see they begin to panic. They're terrified. Um, and they're afraid. And we see that Matthew tells us the boat was already a considerable distance from the land. This would be several miles away from shore. And in the very midst of the sea, uh, they were driven by the wind because the wind was against the direction they were going. It says during the fourth watch of the night, uh, that is a a Jewish term of how they uh, counted time. And so in the Jewish mindset, they counted uh, uh, days and, and, and time a little different. Uh, their day would begin at, uh, at sundown and then to the next sundown. That was the, t- the way that they would correlate to a day. And then they had these different watches, these different sections of the day. And so the fourth watch of the night would have been from 3 in the morning to 6 a.m. So you can imagine at this point after Jesus had gone to the mountain to pray in the evening, that next morning the disciples are still in the middle of the lake. Which means they were probably roaring and, and straining with the, all their might and all their strength on those oars for probably about nine hours or so. Just trying to, trying to survive, right? Trying to get to the other side. And I'm sure they were totally exhausted. And yet we see Jesus walked out to them on the lake. And what would have that been like? To, to see someone coming towards you out there, uh, coming through the, the, the waves, and we see when the disciples saw Jesus, they immediately shouted, it's a ghost. Right? They cried out because they were terrified. Uh, they were operating in fear. And, and all their hope was gone at this point. And so Jesus walks and he shows his disciples the very thing that they feared was this raging sea was merely a set of steps for Jesus to walk upon, for Jesus to travel, to come and and, and get to be with them. I think sometimes we can fear difficulties of life, right? And, and they can begin to overwhelm us and stress us out. And, and while no one likes difficulties in life, um, we need to realize that they don't have to overwhelm us. They don't have to drown us in them. Um, that the Lord is there with us in the midst of those difficulties. And so, when we have those times, when we have those difficulties, those experiences, whether it's a, an illness or the loss of a loved one or financial hardships, I think through those experiences we can discover that we can gain a greater uh, closeness to the Lord, uh, an experience that can bring us closer to Jesus, a greater reliance, a greater dependence upon Him. And I don't wish for anyone to face hardships um, but, but hardships draw us closer to the Lord, right? And, and, and it causes us to realize, where else am I going to go, right? I'm going to go towards the Lord. I think it was uh, Warren Wiersbe that said, um, the difficulties in life will either make you bitter or make you better. They'll make you bitter towards God and you're angry. God, why would you allow this to happen? Why, why, why? And you become so angry at God, you become bitter towards him. Or it'll make you better. You realize, where else am I going to go? God, I need you. I thank you that you're with me. I need you to help me through this circumstance. I'm going to dig into your word. I'm going to pray and I'm going to draw close to you. I'm going to find my comfort in you and your promises. And then next time you find someone else around you going through something similar, with the comfort you've received, you can offer them the same comfort. Right? It's, it's made you better in your relationship with the Lord and, and better able to, to help somebody else that's going through something difficult. So again, we don't like difficult things when they come, but the Lord can use those to draw us closer to him. 
As I was looking at this account, one of the questions I had was, why did the disciples not recognize Jesus? Why did they not recognize this got to be Jesus walking on water? I and mean, we just saw him feed multitudes. Who else can do that? This is probably Jesus walking towards us. Why didn't they recognize him? And I think the answer is because they weren't looking for him. They weren't waiting by faith, right? They were operating in a sense of fear, and that fear had overwhelmed them, and, uh, and, that, and they began to jump to false conclusions. And I think the point is this, that fear and faith cannot live in the same heart at the same time. Right? You can't operate in faith and fear at the same time. And, and the truth is, fear blinds the eyes to the presence of the Lord. Right? We want to have that faith in the Lord, to trust Him, no matter what we're going to face, that He's going to be there with us. We don't have to be fearful. In fact, he says to the disciples, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Why would Jesus say that to them? They're afraid. <laughs> they're fearful that they're going to die. They're fearful of the, the storm. And Jesus is there reminding them, You do not have to fear. I am with you. Be of good cheer. Now, it is also interesting. We see in this experience, Peter, ever impulsive, replies, Lord, if it's you, Tell me that I can come out and come to you walking on the water. Now, he's the only guy that actually got out and walked on the water, although it wasn't too long. Um, but we see the Lord invites Peter to come, and, and this is the only disciple that steps out of the boat. Right? He begins to have some faith in the Lord. And, uh, and so I think, in, a, in essence, there's this interesting aspect here, too, as Jesus is the ultimate example for us, the ultimate leader he could have told Peter, well, you know, Peter, this is too difficult for you. Right? O- only God can walk on water. And I think Jesus knows Peter's temperament. Uh, he's kind of this gun-ho, I can do it, Lord. And so, all right, Peter, come on. Come on out. You walk on water. Let's see how it works for you. Right? And it started to go well, but then Peter began to take his eyes off of Jesus. And then it didn't go so well. And so it reminds me that there are times where Jesus will give us opportunities to, to demonstrate where our faith is at in him, right? to test our own faith. Am I going to sink or, or am I going to do well in this test? And so we see that's what's happening with Peter here. And, and yet his baby steps of faith only last for a moment. And then he begins to take his eyes off the Lord. And with his physical sight, Peter begins to look at the, the huge waves and, and hear the wind roaring. And, and that fear becomes comes back to his heart again. He begins to take his eyes off of the Lord, begins to look at the circumstances around him, and, and he was afraid, and he begins to sink. And so Peter cries out, Lord, save me. And, and I actually love that because this is the, one of the shortest prayers in all of Scripture. Uh, sometimes when you have interaction with people, um, they can have really long and elegant prayers uh, it reminds me of a scene from God's Not Dead um, where the rental car isn't working and he asks the one guy, hey, can you pray for the vehicle? And he just prays, Lord, help this car to work. And he's like, that's it. It's like, do you know a better prayer? <laughs> and, and Peter, he's thinking, what does he say? Does he need to go in a big, long prayer? He just says, Lord, help. Lord, save me. Right? And God responds. He reaches out his hand and grabs Peter and lifts him back up. If the heart is in the right place, God knows our prayer. We don't have to, you know, use fancy words or try to come up with big words or talk in the old King James language, right? Thou, O Lord, I beseech you, please hear me. No, just be honest. Lord, help. (laughs) I need your help. And he'll help you. He'll reach out and help you. And we see that Jesus instantly catches Peter and he says, You of little faith, why did you doubt. Again, a reminder, we're prone to doubt. We're prone to begin to think, I don't know how this is going to work out, and begin to get fearful and doubt the situation. And I think the lesson here is if we take our eyes off of Jesus, if we focus on our circumstances, we'll sink in them. We'll begin to be overwhelmed. We'll fall under the weight of all those problems. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, we realize these are little things compared to God. He can handle them. In fact, it's not really my problem at all. It's God's problem. (laughs) 
and he's going to sort through it. He's going to work it out. I just need to keep my eyes on him. I need to trust him. His word is true. His promises always come to pass. He's faithful. And so we see that if we call to Jesus in faith, he will catch us. He will lift us above seemingly impossible situations. And so Peter, for that moment, let doubt displace his faith. And, and that can happen to us as well if we're not careful. That doubt can creep in and, and begin to displace our faith. And yet we see in all the time that he had been with Jesus, Peter, one of Christ's closest friends, was still learning to trust the Lord completely. I think that's an important lesson for us to learn, to depend upon the Lord, to trust him. Right, as we say in that song earlier, I'm desperate for you. I'm lost without you. Either we believe that is true or we don't. Either we think, well, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm doing okay. I, I need you when I, when I get lost, but right now I'm doing great. Right? I can keep going on my own. I can put on a cruise control. And, but before long, you realize you're lost. <laughs> you need him. You need him to guide you through life. Right? You need him to, to always be. Be the one that you depend upon for everything. And so we need that desperation. We need that dependence upon the Lord. Well, we see Jesus and Peter climb into the boat, and then the storm ceases immediately. The disciples respond to everything they've witnessed in awe and adoration and, and worship of Jesus. And they say, truly, you are the Son of God. And I think this is the essence of worship, recognizing who Jesus is and what he's done and what he's going to do. It's worshiping him for who he is and what he's done, recognizing the awesomeness of Jesus, recognizing how powerful he is, and worshiping him. It's this bowing down before him, realizing his power, his authority, and his love. And so we realize that they're praising him for both who he is and what he has done. And then as they reach the shore, they go to the, this place of Gennesaret. This is on the northwestern shore of the, the Lake of Galilee. And people come to Jesus. It says that they might only touch the hem of his garment and be made well. Hmm. I wonder where they learned that from. Remember the gal with the flow of blood and Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house, and she came, and she thought, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. And she did, and she was made whole. She was made uh, whole again and healed. Uh, that word began to spread. I'm sure she began to tell others, right, I just touched the hem of his garment, I was be and I was whole. I had faith in Jesus. I had faith that he could do it if he wanted, that he could make me clean again because I was unclean. And we see that many people come and with the same mindset. And so the fame of Jesus is spreading and the people are coming to him by the multitude and he's healing those people. Again, what a busy day of ministry. <laughs> I don't think we've had that busy of a day sometimes. You know, think, man, I did a lot today. And then you read the Gospels and you're like, well, I didn't, well, wasn't as busy as Jesus. <laughs> this was a very busy day for him. Again, he still found, found that time to spend with the Father. And, uh, and so we see that Jesus used the stormy experience to bring his followers into a fuller and deeper understanding of who he is, the Son of God, the King of the universe, God Most High. And so we see that he wanted them to know that he is their God and their King. He's the Almighty Lord, right, the creator of the universe. The wind of the waves stopped immediately when he spoke. Why? Because they recognize the voice. He's the one that spoke them into existence. He's the one that can say, be still, and they become still. And so we see that Jesus, when he's present, when he's with us, when he's in the, uh, the boat, he becomes our lifeboat in essence. And we can either trust him to calm the storm, or we can trust him to calm us in the midst of the storm. And sometimes we, we need both of those things. So in closing, never believe that you or your resources are too little for God to use. Never believe that you are too little to serve God. God takes delight in those who are humble. Don't believe me? Go and read the account of David. 
His own father didn't think that he was going to be the one that Samuel was going to come and anoint. Ah, he's just this ruddy old boy out in the field with, the, with the, the sheep. And God says, he's the one. He's got a heart like mine. He's got a heart that seeks after me. So man looks at the outward. God looks at the heart, right? So don't believe that you or your resources are too little to serve God. God can do abundantly more than you can ever ask or think for his glory. And then let's be thankful for what God has provided, right? Let's be thankful that he is, he's blessed us. And we want to use wisely what the things that he has provided. We want to use wisely the resources he's given unto us for his glory. And then we want to trust in God's unlimited resources, right? Our job is merely to provide the fish and the loaves. Leave the, the rest up to him, right? Let him do the things that only he can do and to trust in his perfect timing and his grace that he will provide exactly what we need when we need it. And when the storms of this life come our way, they will come our way. It's been said you're either entering into a storm, you're in the middle of a storm, or you're coming out of a storm. Uh, You're in one of those three areas. Um, We need to keep our eyes upon Jesus. Right? We need to realize that he's going to be with us in those circumstances. And when the sudden waves of life hit us, when we get that sudden news of a loved one or a friend passing away or the health condition that we weren't hoping for and it doesn't seem like there's going to be a great outcome or some calamity that we're facing, we don't need to be overwhelmed. We don't need to be fearful. We can trust the Lord. Right? He's going to get us home safely. He's going to be with us. He's going to help us through the circumstance. No matter what we face, right? he's holding us together. He's the one that's ensuring that our heart is still beating, that there's lung in our airs to breathe. Right? As we said earlier, this is the air I breathe. Who gave us that breath? Who gave us the air? God did. Right? And if you think that you're in control of those things, man, when we go to bed, we, we don't even know <laughs> we're still breathing and our heart is beating. God knows. He's the one that takes care of us even when we slumber, looking out over his sheep. So we can trust the Lord to be with us. Again, we go through something difficult. We do not need to be afraid because Jesus is with you. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. God is our ever-present help. We can turn to him and trust him. Jesus is present with us. So let's trust him more than the fear that comes into our heart. Let's trust him to either calm the storm or calm us until we get to the other side, until he calls us home to be with him forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to get into your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the example of John the Baptist and his determination to speak out and and speak for what is right. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to speak the truth and love to those around us, to point them to you. Lord, we pray that when that happens in our own life, where our conscience is pricked by the scriptures or by your, your spirit, that, Lord, we'd be listening, that we'd be receptive, that, Lord, we would repent of our sins, we would turn and seek your forgiveness and your grace. Help us, Lord, to be about restoration and reconciliation, the ministry you've called us to. And Lord, when we feel those times that we don't know how you're going to come through in a situation, we don't know how you're going to provide, we don't know how you're going to guide us through something, Lord, help us to know that you have unlimited resources. You've got resources we have known nothing about. There's nothing too hard for you. So Lord, help us not to sell ourselves short or discredit ourselves that we're worthless because God in your hands you can turn a masterpiece from a mess Lord there's nothing too hard for you so we pray Lord you'd help us to to allow you to use our lives and use our resources for your glory Lord that there be much fruit in our walk with you And Lord, when the storms of this life come, help us to keep our eyes upon you. Help us not to sink into fear, 
but to walk upon the waves of faith, to know that you are with us and you are our ever-present help in our time of need. Help us, Lord, to draw closer to you when troubles do come our way, to have that time with you where we hear from you, we're encouraged and cling tightly to your promises, to your truth. And Father, we pray if there be anyone here this morning who has yet to make that decision of faith, yet to realize that you love them and that you died on the cross where their sins was buried and rose from the dead. God, we ask that today would be that day of salvation. And if you were here this morning, you'd say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to get right with God. I'm not certain that if today was my last, I'd be with him in heaven. I don't have that blessed assurance. I need to get right with God. And if that's you this morning, I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you make that decision, where you put the full weight of your faith in Jesus Christ. You surrender everything to him. Depend upon him going forward. Allow him to change you and transform your life. If that's you and you're ready to make that decision, I simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and truly mean it in your heart. God, I realize that you love me, that my sin separates me from you. I believe, Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins, that you were buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. You come into my heart and my life today. Be my Savior and my Lord. I surrender all of myself to you. Help me to follow you from this day forward. And put your spirit within me that I may do your will. God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for adopting me into your family. I pray you'd help me to keep my eyes upon you going forward. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look, if that was you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Jesus Christ, perhaps a rededication, coming back home as a prodigal, love to speak with you after service, uh, give you some resources, pray with you, give you a Bible if you don't have one.